Alright, um, you know that once a week or so, uh, once a month, whatever, how often we do this, uh, we have a power hour and we invite a speaker in. This month uh, we've invited an author. I'm going to try and get an author to come in every month. Uh, so I need some extra names. So can there. Um, Sarah Zarr has been at Valley probably three or four times. Um, as far as I know, she's, she's one of our fans. We love having Sarah come out. She's uh, come to Valley to speak about reading and literacy. She is an author of several books, numerous ones. I believe they've even won some awards, have they not? I brought my little medal. There you go. <laughs> uh, so you'll see some of those. Um, I know Joan's planning next quarter to read one of Sarah's books in class. So if you have Joan, be prepared for that. So uh, without any further wasting of my time or yours, let's hand the time over to Sarah. <laughs> because all the other rooms are closed because of the faculty <laughs> meeting. But I'll try and make it interesting for you, too. Um, the other thing is, I was looking at the sign on the door, and I was like, that author photo, I've aged four years and gained 20 pounds since that was taken, so that's how I look different. I'm 44 now. Um, I'm a writer. Um, I live here in Salt Lake City now. I live downtown. Um, I grew up in San Francisco, California in the 70s in the early 80s, <laughs> um, and then uh, lived in the suburb of San Francisco for a while after my parents got divorced and my mom remarried. We moved to the town where my stepdad lived, um, and then I went to college. I went to San Francisco State. It took me six years to get my Bachelor of Arts degree because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I didn't know that I could do what I ended up doing. I didn't know I could write. Because um, in my family growing up, no one ever said anything inspiring to me and my sister, like, you can be anything you want, or just work hard and you can get it, or I believe in you. Um, no one ever said anything like that. So I didn't really start writing until I was kind of in my late 20s and decided, well, I'm going to try it. I don't need anyone's permission to tell me that I can do this. I'm just going to see if I can do it. Um, one reason my, my parents didn't say inspiring things to me, I think, is because our family lived in survival mode a lot. Um, my dad, uh, he could not keep a job, was part of the big problem there, and the reason why he couldn't keep a job was he was a, he was a, had a severe, <laughs> Severe case, I don't know how to say it. He was an alcoholic and a bad one, like not a functioning one that could keep a job, one that was passed out a lot. And um, that was just kind of, I bring this up, I have a point <laughs> later. Um, I'm not just trying to spill my guts, but that's just kind of how I grew up. Was like, let's make it day to day. My mom basically was like a single mom, even though my dad was around, and just working and getting by. And um, so I wasn't. I wasn't taught um, to kind of the whole like believe in yourself thing, and I and I wasn't encouraged to have dreams, and so that is why when I went to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life because, again, I didn't know I had options. Um, but I did end up getting a degree. I started as an English major, and then I hated that. And it's weird. I don't know if I'm really going to talk about literacy and reading because that. That's not what interests me. That's not why I became a writer. Um, but it's all connected. But I started as an English major, and I just ended up hating it because it was so much about analyzing books. And it took, to me, everything that I loved about books away from the reading experience. I didn't like trying to like guess what the author was trying to do. I just wanted to read a book and enjoy it. And I especially, when I got into my all Shakespeare class, I did very, very poorly. Um, like I, I either got a D or I ended up dropping the class. I can't remember. All this is to say, if you're interested in being a writer, you don't have to be good at in your English class or analyzing literature. Um, it's, it's, it helps if you can spell and do grammar and things like that. But if you have dreams of being a writer and you're like, gee, but I'm not getting very good grades in English, don't worry about it. Um, I, I changed my major about halfway through 
college to speech and communication studies just so I could get some kind of corporate job when I graduated. Again, I still don't know what I wanted to do. Um, so then I just kind of went on with my life and I had jobs, but I kept writing. Like I always had story ideas in my head and I always would try, I had the beginnings of a lot of things in notebooks. Like I could never finish anything, but I had so many first chapters <laughs> of different ideas that I never quite got beyond. Um, but just my imagination would go crazy all the time. Um, this was, now I'm in the 90s. So during and after college, it's like mid 90s, which is probably like before, it's still before you guys were born. <laughs> I'm not good with math, but yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I had to, I had this job where I had to commute every day. So I'd take this train to downtown San Francisco from where I lived. And I would just stare out the window because we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have iPods. And we had Walkman, like with tapes or CDs, they, they were huge, I carried them around. Um, so sometimes I listened to music, but really all I had was whatever was going on my, in my head was the only thing I had to entertain me. So as I was coming up with stories, um, but because of this childhood issue I was talking about, like I just didn't have any confidence in myself and I didn't know that I could, if I worked at it, try to actually be a writer as like my job and get paid for it and have my books published. Um, and then somewhere in the mid 90s, uh, the internet was invented and I got a laptop computer and um, when I think about how expensive that was and how little it could do compared to what cheap laptops can do now, it's crazy. But uh, And I, I got online and I started going into chat rooms where writers were and um, just talking to other people who were working on stuff. And I started to realize that uh, writers, these published writers that I was meeting online were just normal people who wanted to write and worked at it hard and just kept practicing until they got better and better and eventually got published. Whereas before I thought writers are special people who probably come from some boarding school in New York or something and like they have connections in the publishing industry or they're like relatives of Donald Trump or something. Like I just didn't they just didn't see it didn't seem like something I just as a normal kid from kind of a messed up family could do. And then as I met writers and realized that it was just more about wanting it and working at it, I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. Um, and so I sat down and I decided the first thing I should probably do is finish a book. Because like I said, I had like a million beginnings of stuff, but I knew there's no way I could like start sending stuff to publishers if all I had was a bunch of first chapters. So I just decided um, my first goal was gonna be to finish something. And uh, that was hard, like it was, it's not fun. Like once it stops being fun, if any of you are creative writers, you know like a new idea is exciting and then when it becomes old, you just get bored with it and it's hard to push through the middle part. Um, but I made myself finish because I knew that was something I needed to do. And I submitted it to this contest that this publisher in New York had. And I thought, I was so sure that I was going to win. Like I thought no one worked harder than me or wrote a better book than me. And I'm sure I'm going to win and then go on and become rich and famous. And I didn't win. And um, I decided to write another book. And I wrote another book, and that took each book along the line here took about, I'd say, a year and a half. And I was also working, you know, full time job. So this was like evenings and weekends, like kind of like a hobby, but a hobby I was very dedicated to. And um, so with this second book, I never even sent it out to anyone because I just got so insecure after rejection with my first book, I, I got like cold feet and I didn't want to send the second book anywhere. So no one ever saw that. It just went into a drawer after I spent a year and a half on it because I was so insecure. Meanwhile, I wasn't even telling like my friends and family that I was writing. Um, it felt so scary to tell people that this is what I wanted to do because I just thought they were going to laugh in my face. I mean, my own dad. <laughs> 
May he rest in peace. Um, he, one time we were talking on the phone, I lived in California and he lived in Pennsylvania by then. And we were talking on the phone and he was a little bit drunk. And I was saying, I started to tell him, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working at writing, you know, I'm starting to like send stuff out to agents and I'm like, you know, putting myself out there to maybe teach some local workshops and stuff. He was like, what do you know? Why, what do you know about writing? Like, what are you doing? It was exactly what I feared someone would say if I expressed that I was interested in writing. And, um, you know, I was like, I don't, know, I don't know what to say to that. And then he said, oh, I don't think, if I ever saw a book by you, like, in a store or on a, in a, on a shelf somewhere, I don't think I could stand it. You know, I couldn't stand to look at it. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> and he said, oh, because I'd be jealous, you know. So... These are the kind of obstacles that I had. I had a lot of like emotional obstacles <laughs> to get over to like keep keep telling myself that I, that it was okay for me to be doing this. Even if I failed at it, it was okay to try and it was it was okay to say like this is what I want to do. But I kind of kept it private for a long time because I, I wanted to it became very important to me and I wanted to protect it and not expose it to like people I couldn't trust like that. Um, so anyway, I wrote a third book. And I, by that time, I had found a literary agent, which is the person that like can get your books in front of the editors at the publishing houses in New York, and then they get part of your money, but it's worth it. Um, so I had found a literary agent, and I thought, this is the book. Like it was super autobiographical, you know, kind of based on my life, and. I thought this this is the one, you know, I've been doing this for like seven years now, something's got to happen or I'm going to quit. And um, then my agent didn't even like it and I fired her. Um, so then I wrote a fourth book. <laughs> and all this, all this time, like, I was very discouraged. I mean, I, I just thought, this is ridiculous, like at a certain point, I should probably give up. Because um, I just had no evidence that this was going to be successful at all, ever. And so I wrote a fourth book, and by then I had moved um, to Salt Lake City, and I was in a writer's group, and um, they were very helpful, giving giving me feedback and helping me make the book better. And and I ended up, I submitted it to a local, like Utah Arts Council has a contest. I submitted it to their contest for an unpublished novel, and I won. Finally, something happened. <laughs> this was 2003, and I had started like in 1996 or something. Um, and that book eventually became my first published book, Story of a Girl, and that's the one that got me this National Book Award finalist medal, which is something I'm still super proud of and can't believe I got. Um, and that was that book came out in 2007. So I won that prize for it in 2003. It didn't come out from a publisher in stores and everything until 2007. So it was like a 10 to 12 year <laughs> journey of trying and failing and trying and failing and like overcoming my own um, insecurities and like fear to finally be able to say like I'm a writer. I'm succeeding as a writer. Um, and then I thought, well, now everything's going to be super easy because I had a book come out and got this medal, and now writing should be great and easy, and I'll never, never have any problems again. And then when I was writing my sec my fifth novel, but my what would be my second published novel, I had like almost like a nervous breakdown, not to where I was in danger, but I would just. I, really a major depression. Like I would just be on the kitchen floor every day crying and saying, I can't do it. Because now I have this pressure. Like before, no one cared that I existed or knew that I existed. It didn't matter if I ever wrote a book. Who, who cared? And now I had people knew that I existed and they wanted me to write another book and I was getting money for it and so I had to do it. And it was a lot of pressure. And I didn't respond well to the pressure. And I just cried a lot and got really depressed and I had to do like seven rounds of revision with my editor, which is a lot. Like normal for me is maybe four. Um, so that means I rewrote the book seven times, like from beginning to end. Um, and but it eventually came out and it was fine. And then I wrote a third book 
and it was also very difficult. And then it, during the third book, I think, I realized this is just difficult. <laughs> like, it's always going to be difficult. Both the act of writing is difficult um, because you're translating, you're trying to like take this image out of your imagination and translate it into words that other people can read and understand and have feelings. And um, so that's hard. And I also realized I was never going to totally overcome the emotional and psychological obstacles of fear of failure, fear of disapproval, um, fear of what my friends would think, you know, fear of like writing something that would make my mother unhappy. Like <laughs> there's just, there's always going to be these, these obstacles. And so I just kind of accepted that. And then I wrote a fourth book and then uh, my fifth book, which is the one that we have over here, the Lucy Variations, just came out last year. Um, and it's kind of about writing. It's about piano, but it's writing in disguise. And then I did a fun thing, which was I wrote a book with my friend. So we each wrote half. Like it's a chapters back and forth. It's like two girls who are going to be each other's college roommates and they're emailing over the summer before college. And that was fun. Um, but one thing I, I noticed, um, if I look at my the five books that I've written, um, I go, okay, the first one, that character, she's kind of from a working class family and she's got a lot of issues with her dad and a lot of struggles. Second one, the character was from a poor background, kind of like mine, where we never had enough money, but by the time the book starts, her mom is remarried and they're kind of more settled. Third book is about a pastor's daughter and they don't really have any major financial troubles. Fourth book, now my character is working uh, into the middle class and upper middle class. One of the characters, anyway, that, that book has two points of view. Um, and then I wrote this book, and this character is like straight up lives in a mansion. And I was just kind of observing that about myself. I'm like, what's, what's happening to me? Like, I'm, <laughs> as I get older and my life gets more settled, I, I'm, I'm increasingly my characters are kind of moving up in social class. And I felt like I was kind of trying to leave my own past behind in some way and not write about people that had like so many tangible struggles. Um, not that people with money don't have struggles, but just the kind of nitty gritty daily survival mode stuff. So I decided with my next book, the book I'm working on now, um, I wanted to go back to the beginning, kind of circle back to the kind of story I was telling with my first book. And um, I thought about my own life, and I thought about me and my sister um, growing up the way we did, and just kind of dealing with our dad failing in one way, and, and our mom, like, she wasn't terrible, but she had a lot of issues herself, you know? So there was, there was a way that we felt kind of abandoned, I think, and like we didn't have great parents. Um, and so I wanted to take that that experience and write about these two sisters and really dig back into my own background a little bit. And so I thought, even though it's still in progress, I'm still doing a revision, I thought I'd read to you like one page of the new book. And then I can talk more generally about publishing and writing and reading, and you can ask any questions that you might have. Um, so this is the, right now, this is the beginning, although it's still being rewritten over and over again. Let's give you an idea of what I'm writing about now. We were precarious. Before Dixie and I were even born, we were destined to walk this razor's edge of trouble that went back through generations we never knew. Abandonment and addiction and shame, big dreams thwarted by small hopes, fear and failure, with just enough good luck to encourage more mistakes and just enough bad luck that no one ever thought anyone, anything was their own fault. From the second our parents met, this was our future. If our time as a family were a movie, anyone settling into a seat with popcorn and soda would have guessed, right at the opening credits, it wasn't going to end well. Except us, we didn't know. For a long time, we didn't know. Because when you're a kid, all you know is what you know, and to you, it's normal. As you get older, you start to see. You get a feeling that comes from somewhere primal and eternal, from stars and mountains and water, from the created order of the universe itself, a deep whisper that says, 
This is not how things are meant to be. What I learned is no matter how loud that whisper gets, even if it turns into a scream way down inside you, you still have to choose to listen and strain to hear. Some people don't ever hear it, or they can't. I don't know which it is. It's easier for me to accept can't, especially when it comes to mom, because if she could and didn't, that's a whole other thing to reckon with. When I tell some people my story, our story, I guess, the story of me and Dixie, and the when and how for our family, they listen and widen their eyes at certain points and shake their heads. Why didn't you just, didn't you think, should, shouldn't you? Other people, people who live their lives on the insides of these stories, aren't so dismayed. They know the answers to why didn't you just. They know about how when you're the one in the movie, you're trapped. They know how hard it is to choose to hear the whisper. A social worker once said to me, while she looked over my file with flat eyes that had seen it all, I guess what happened is you fell through the cracks. Fell through the cracks. Us, me and Dixie, like we were loose change in the sofa. So this book, these sisters, it's narrated by the older sister, they, uh, it's kind of about sisters, it's kind of about money. They end up finding a bag of money, which maybe is just like wish fulfillment for me as the author, and uh, it leads them into some trouble. They kind of go on the run, but that's kind of the like brief history of me as a writer. Maybe it didn't feel brief, but that's, that's how I started and, and what I'm doing now. Um, I write full time, which does not mean I write 40 hours a week, but it means that's what I do for my primary income. I also teach creative writing for a university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, but I only have to go there twice a year. The rest is done by email. And occasionally I go and travel if I have a book out and like do conferences and once in a while do school visits like this, although I don't like going to most schools. I like coming here. <laughs> um, there's a lot of schools that, um, well, anyway, this is going to all be on video, so I won't say anything. But um, <laughs> anyway, I like coming here. So I just think right now I'll pause and just see if you have any questions about anything I've said or writing or publishing, feel free to ask them. If you don't, I can feed you some questions or I can keep going more generally. But any questions so far? Yes, black tank top. What inspired you to be such like a writer? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, I guess I didn't talk about that. <laughs> why, why, why writing? Um, partly I think it was just, that's just, for whatever reason, I always had a vivid imagination, and I thought the stuff I was making up in my head was interesting. And when you, when you want to be a writer, you have to have a certain amount of ego, where I think the stuff going on in my head might be interesting to other people, and they should read it. <laughs> um, but a lot of it was, and this does connect to the literacy and reading thing, I read a lot. Um, we, for, for my mom, and I think this is still true for families that struggle with money, a library card and a public library are two of the best things for, for parents that don't have resources because you get all the free books you want, you have a place to go that doesn't cost money, um, there's people like librarians and stuff that care and like can help make recommendations. Like, it's just the li I think the library system is just something that makes our country great. I think it's awesome. Um, so I just spent a lot of time in the library and I just read. I just read a ton and um, is it really 140? Yes, ma'am. Oh gosh. Um, no, it's, it's Anyway, so I think that all just fed into my ma imagination, and I always loved books, like either for escape or to, as I got older, to make sense of the world and try and get what was going on. But I think I think that's probably where it all came from, was the reading. And then someone behind you, did you have a question? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Yes. Sorry. I'll look over there. Okay, so how to figure out like how you actually get your book published. When I started, there you know, there wasn't all this information online like there is now. So back to the library, I went to the library and I looked in the reference section and there was a thing called the literary marketplace. That's all irrelevant now because you can find everything you need to know online. The main things for traditional publishing, when I say traditional publishing, I mean one of the big six publishers that's back east. 
and they edit your book and they design the cover and they do all the work and they work with your agent and everything is distributed in stores and online and all of that, like traditional paper publishing. Although these are all available as ebooks now, of course, too. But for that kind of traditional model, it's about finding a literary agent and then they kind of do the rest for you. So finding a literary agent, if you just Google like finding a literary agent, you the main thing to know is research them to make sure they're not frauds and you never pay them any money up front. They only make money if you make money. So they get a percentage of your money, but you should never be charged anything up front. It should not cost you anything to be a writer. Yes? So I've been trying for like years to start my own book, but like I have a really hard like motivation to like sit down and like actually do it and like with having like a really bad memory, it's really hard for me to remember all my thoughts. Like how would you like give me advice to like find motivation and keep my ideas together? It's difficult. Like I I every day have trouble with motivation because there's a million things that are easier than writing. Um, for the keeping track of your ideas. I just, I always carry either like a little notepad and a pen, or if I don't want to carry a bag or something, I take like an index card and just fold it up and put it in my pocket and have something to write with, and then I try and capture my thoughts as they come to me, or I like type them into my phone or dictate it, you know, just because you will forget. Like your best ideas you might have like while you're staring into space in class and you will not remember them when it's time to write. So. You just have to like jot everything down enough that you'll remember what you were thinking of. Okay, I just suddenly feel like we only have like a minute left. But, um, they make you feel. Like but no, like the motivation part is really tough. I mean, even with now that I get book contracts and I know I'm going to get paid and like I have a deadline and I know it's my job, it's still getting from not writing to writing takes a lot of time and effort. Once I'm doing it, then it's more enjoyable and the time goes by, but like transitioning to something, it's just like human tendency to procrastinate anything that's difficult. Are we getting shut down? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was trying to read your hand signals. We're talking. Any other questions? One thing people sometimes ask is, what about how come, you know, your books haven't been made into movies or something? That is a very complicated process. My first book was optioned for the movies, which means someone who was interested in making it into a movie kind of rented the right to do that, and they had to pay me like $4,000 like every 18 months um, to hold on to the right to do that. But after like three years, they never got the financing together and no movie was ever made. And that's what happens 99% of the time when a writer's book is optioned. That's what happens because the movie business requires so many, so much money to make a movie and so many little pieces to come together and like the cast and the financing and the producing and all of that. So it's something that's fun to get excited about when you're writing a book like, oh, maybe this will get optioned for a movie. But the chances of it actually getting made are very slim, but it's another like little way that you can make money on the side um, without having to do anything because it already exists. And if someone wants to pay you to have the right to make the movie, it's just free money. And the money part, um, it sounds exciting when you like get a book contract and it's like, oh, we're gonna pay you fifty thousand dollars to write this book, and it's a lot of money, but. Then your agent gets 15% and you pay like 35% in taxes and then that what's left of that is paid out over like two years. So still making less than like a teacher <laughs> when you add it all up. But it's I'm, I'm very lucky to be getting paid to write at all. Um, and, then, and then my teaching job gives me a little extra income. And then things like royalties, like my first two books because they've been out for a long time. They've earned back all the money that my publisher paid me, which means every six months I get a royalty check. Sometimes it might be like as low as like $700 or something, and I think my highest one was maybe like $14,000 long ago. But then I had to live on that $14,000 for like a year after paying the taxes and everything. So it's not 
It's not like a way to get rich if that's <laughs> what, what you're interested in with writing. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, good question. What do I write about? Um, they're standalone, so they're not they're not a series. They're not connected. I haven't written any sequels yet. I'm thinking about a sequel to my second book right now. But and they're all I should have said this at the beginning. But all my books are contemporary realism, which means everything that happens in my books is something that could happen in reality on the time space continuum in science as we understand it now. So there's no fantasy element. There's no future element, there's no sci-fi element. It's just people in complicated relationships. And the thing I'm most interested in writing about is um, how the characters are their own worst enemies. Um, you know, you always have kind of like bad guys in stories. And so there's always some force of antagonism that's more direct and external, somebody or some situation or something. But the, the second layer of that that is most interesting to me is how the characters are their own number one obstacle because of fear, insecurity, or like not knowing how to give and receive love, or not knowing how to give and receive friendship, difficult relationships with parents. Um, just all of the complicated human stuff is what interests me. I like reading about other worlds and, you know, Harry Potter or whatever, but when I'm writing, like, this is what... I want to write about because I'm always trying to understand human relationships and like why at 44 do I still not get along with my mother or you know what do I wish my relationship with my dad had been like before he died and how has that affected me all that stuff because that's what that's the kind of stuff I write about.